you will hear a conversation between a psychiatrist in the medical centre of the college and a new student. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four. Now listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions one to four. Hello, sit down, please. Thank you. Now you are a new patient, aren't you?、Y、yes, that's right. Okay, so I'd better get some basic details down first. Right, we'll start with your name. Martin Hansen. Do you spell that S O N or S E N? H A N S E N. Okay, and you're a first year student? Yes, I am. Study in、uh, electronics, actually. Ah, I hope you enjoy it. Thanks. And your address? Two eight o five Hesperian Avenue, Hayward. Two eight o five and Hesperian. Yes, that's H E S P E R I A N, Hayward, H A Y W A R D. And your phone number? Seven three four two four six five five. Seven three four two six four five five. No, you got the six and the four the wrong way round. It's two four six five five. Huh? Sorry. Right. And um, when were you born? Ah,、uh, the fifteenth of June, nineteen eighty six. Here in New Zealand? No, I was born in Sydney. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions five to ten. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions five to ten. Good. So, what's your problem? Well. Frankly, I wonder whether it is a problem. I get the blues, and it lasts for quite a while. I don't know how to. Yes, we all feel sad or get the blues now and again. Generally, our sadness lessens in time, and with the support of friends. However, if the depression leads to difficulty in thinking and greatly disrupts your daily routine, it can be evidence of a psychiatric problem. What do you feel exactly? I always feel sad and worthless. I find it hard to fall asleep and wake up early in the morning. How long has it lasted? Nearly half a month. Do you feel fatigue or loss of energy, or you may have lost interest or pleasure in usual activities? Yes, sometimes. At first, I thought I could overcome it by myself, but I failed. And、that... I'm so glad that you came here. It seems that you are suffering mild depression from your symptoms. Depression? Yes, I feel depressed sometimes. But why would I? Depression may occur as a result of biochemical changes in the body. Alcohol, amphetamines, cocaine, and LSD can bring on depression. Those who have a family history of depression usually have a greater risk of depression. Sometimes the worrying changes in life can lead to depression. I see. I had a really bad breakup of a love relationship. It makes me feel hopeless. Do you think I need some treatment? Yes. Antidepressant medications are often used to treat depression if it is serious. But I don't suggest them at first because of the side effects. I suggest psychotherapy, which can give you support and help you regain control. So, do I need to come here every day? No, I will arrange counselling sessions for you, which will last twelve to twenty weeks. You come here once or twice each week. The psychotherapy is directed at helping you gain insight and understanding about events in your life, which may have contributed to your depression. With growing insight, you can often learn more effective ways of coping with your feelings and changing your behaviour. What can I do to take care of myself? Well, at first you should do some physical exercises on a regular basis, at least three times a week. How is your food? Do you eat well?、Mm, yes, I think so. I eat at my homestay family. Good. Find a hobby or a positive recreational activity to participate in once or twice a week, 
I know it's difficult for you, though. When you feel it's hard to overcome the depression, come to the counselling session. Remember, ask for help if the load is too heavy to handle. Yes, I'll try. So, when will my counselling session begin? I'm going to arrange that for you. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear part of an interview between Dr. Hilsden, a member of staff on a fashion design course, and a student, Julia, who is applying to do the course. First, look at questions 11 to 13. Right, Julia. So, from your CV and portfolio, and what you've already told me, you seem to be very much the sort of person we're looking for on the postgraduate course. So tell me, you finished your fashion design course in London four years ago. Did you think of carrying straight on and doing a higher degree at the time? Yes, but there were financial pressures. Ah. So I ended up working in the retail industry, as you can see from my CV. Mm -hmm. And actually, it was a very useful experience. Hmm. In what way? Well, I was lucky to get the job with Fashion Now. They're a big store. And one of my priorities was to get as much experience as possible in different areas. So that was good because I had the chance to work in lots of different departments. And having direct contact with the customers meant I was able to see how they reacted to innovation, uh, to new fashion ideas. Because with Fashion Now, a designer might show something in New York or Milan, and there'll be something similar in the shop within weeks. So that was probably the most useful thing for me. Right. And so what's made you decide to do a postgraduate course now? Um, well, while I enjoyed working at Fashion Now, and I learned a lot there, I felt, uh, well, the way forward would have been to develop my managerial skills, rather than my skills in fashion design, and I'm not sure that's what I want to do. Mm, yes. When I was doing my degree in London, I'd been interested in women's wear, but I know that there's been a lot of work done in areas like new fabric construction, and though I'm not intending to go too deeply into the technology, I'd be very interested in looking at how new fabrics could be used in children's wear. So I'd like the chance to pursue that line. Yes, good. And are you at all concerned about what it's going to be like coming back into an academic context after being away from it for several years? No, I'm looking forward to it. Huh. But I'm basically more interested in the application than the theory. Or at least that's what I've found so far. And I'm hoping the course will give me the contacts and skills I need eventually to set up my own enterprise. I'm particularly interested by the overseas links that the department has. Yes, many of our students look overseas or to international companies for sponsorship of their projects. Before the talk continues, look at questions 14 to 20.
As you listen to the second part of the talk, answer the questions. And the facilities here look excellent. I just went to look at the library. It's really impressive. There's so much room compared with the one at my old university. Yes, most students find it's a good place to study,、mm. and there are link-ups to other universities, of course, and all the usual electronic sources. The staff run an information skills program, which we recommend all postgraduates do in the first week or two. Design students find these special collections particularly useful. Yes. Then we have a separate computer centre, which has its own academic coordinator, Tim Spender. He's got a background in art design, and the ethos of the centre is that it's a studio for innovation and creativity, rather than a computer laboratory. Oh right, I liked the study spaces where students can sit and discuss work together. Very useful for joint projects. We always had to do that sort of thing in the cafeteria when I was an undergraduate. <laughs> And I read in the brochure that there's a separate resource for photography. Yes, it's called Photo Media. It's not just for photography, but things like digital imaging and new media. It's a resource for all our students, not just fashion design. And we encourage students to work there, producing work that crosses disciplinary boundaries. It's well used. In fact, it's doubled in size since it was set up three years ago. And we also have an offshoot from that, which is called time-based media. This is for students who want to develop their ideas in the area of the moving image or sound. That's in a new building that was specially built for it just last year. But there are plans to expand it, as the present facilities are overstretched already. Right. Now,、uh, is there anything you would like to ask about the course itself? Um. I know it's a combination of taught modules and a specialist project,、mm -hmm. but how does assessment fit in? Well,、uh, as you'd expect on a course of this nature, it's an ongoing process. The degree course has four stages, and there are what we call progress reviews at the end of each of the first three. Then the final assessment is based on your project. You have to produce a report, which is a critical reflection on your work. And is there some sort of fashion show? There's an exhibition. The projects aren't all focused on clothes as such. Some are more experimental, so that seems more appropriate. We ask representatives of fashion companies along, and it's usually well attended. Right. And another thing I wanted to ask. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You'll hear a woman calling Laverton Arts Centre for some information. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Laverton Art Centre, how can I help you? Hello, I've been to the art centre a few times recently, and I understand you have this scheme for regular visitors. The Friends of Laverton Art Centre, yes, that's right. I wonder if you could tell me a little about it. I mean, how much it costs and what benefits it offers, things like that. Certainly. Well, first of all, the good news is that we've recently changed the scheme. It used to cost fifteen pounds a year, but now it's free. All you have to do is fill in an application form. 
You can either come to the Arts Centre and do that here, or you can go to our website and apply online. And so what are the benefits of joining? There are actually quite a few. As a friend of Laberton Arts Centre, you'll receive a newsletter every three months with information on all the forthcoming events. That sounds useful. You also get priority booking for shows and concerts in the main theatre. Can you explain how that works exactly? Yes. What that means is that when tickets go on sale, for the first two days they're only available to friends of the Arts Centre. So as long as you book early, you can make sure you get seats. Great! Do you ever offer discounts to friends of the centre? Under the old system, when you had to pay to be a member, we did. Under the new system, there won't be any discounts for shows in the main theatre or films at the art cinema. Having said that, we will be offering some discounts to members for performances in the small theatre. There'll be information about this in each issue of the newsletter. I suppose I can find that information online as well, can I? Absolutely. Actually, we're redoing our website at the moment. Right now, there actually isn't a special section for Friends of the Arts Centre on the website. Once the site's been redesigned, there will be. You'll be able to put in your username and password and enter a special section just for you. It sounds excellent. Are there any requirements, though? I mean, as a member, do I have to do anything? Yes, sorry, I forgot to mention that. There are no formal requirements at all, though obviously we have this scheme to encourage people to attend events here regularly. So, we ask that you attend at least four events a year, whatever they are, if you possibly can. Nobody's going to count, though, and it's totally up to you. That sounds fair enough. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. While you're here, we're actually conducting a short survey of people who phone up the Arts Centre. Would you mind if I asked you a few questions? It'll only take a couple of minutes. Sure, no problem. Thanks a lot. So, how many times have you visited Laverton Arts Centre in the last six months? Well, I've only lived in the area for the last four months, so not that many times. Um, three, I suppose. Yes, that's right. Fine. And how did you first find out about the Arts Centre? Let me think. Oh, yes, a friend invited me to a concert and I came with her. Have you ever seen a film at the Arts Cinema here? No, I haven't, to be honest. In fact, until you mentioned it earlier, I didn't realise you even had a cinema. One more question. If we offered a free tour of the Arts Centre, including things such as going backstage to look at the dressing rooms, would you be interested in going on it? Oh, yes, definitely. I think a tour like that would be very interesting. I'd even pay for it. That's great. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecturer in education talking about some experiments done in the USA to investigate the effects of reducing class sizes. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40 on pages 71 and 72.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. All over the world, there are passionate arguments going on about how educational systems can be improved. And of all the ideas for improving education, few are as simple or attractive as reducing the number of pupils per teacher. It seems like common sense. But do these ideas have any theoretical basis? Today, I want to look at the situation in the USA and at some of the research that has been done here in America on the effects of reducing class sizes. In the last couple of decades or so, there has been considerable concern in the United States over educational standards here, following revelations that the country's secondary school students perform poorly relative to many Asian and European students. In addition... Statistics have shown that students in the nation's lower-income schools in the urban areas have achievement levels far below those of middle-class and upper-middle-class schools. So would reducing class sizes solve these problems? Well, we have to remember that it does have one obvious drawback. It's expensive. It requires more teachers and possibly more classrooms, equipment, and so on. On the other hand, if smaller classes really do work, the eventual economic benefits could be huge. Better education would mean that workers did their jobs more efficiently, saving the country millions of dollars. It would also mean that people were better informed about their health, bringing savings in things like medical costs and days off sick. So what reliable information do we have about the effects of reducing class sizes? There's plenty of anecdotal evidence about the effect on students' behavior, but what reliable evidence do we have for this? Let's have a look at three research projects that have been carried out in the USA in the last couple of decades or so. The first study I'm going to look at took place in the state of Tennessee in the late 1980s. It involved some 70 schools. In its first year, about 6,400 students were involved, and by the end of the study, four years later, the total number involved had grown to 12,000. What happened was that students entering kindergarten were randomly assigned to either small classes of 13 to 17 students or regular-sized classes of 22 to 26. The students remained in whatever category they had been assigned to through the third grade, and then, after that, they joined a regular classroom. After the study ended in 1989, researchers conducted dozens of analyses of the data. Researchers agree that there was significant benefit for students in attending smaller classes, and it also appears that the beneficial effect was stronger for minority students. However, there's no agreement on the implications of this. We still don't know the answer to questions like how long students have to be in smaller classes to get a benefit, and how big that benefit is, for example. The second project was much larger and took place in California. Like the Tennessee study, it focused on students from kindergarten through to grade three. But in this case, all schools throughout the state were involved. The experiment is still continuing, but results have been very inconclusive with very little improvement noted. And the project has, in fact, also had several negative aspects. It meant an increased demand for teachers in almost all California districts. So the better-paying districts got a lot of the best teachers, including a fair number that moved over from the poorer districts. And there were a lot of other problems with the project. For example, there weren't any effective procedures for evaluation. All in all, this project stands as a model of what not to do in a major research project. A third initiative took place in the state of Wisconsin at around the same time as the California project began, and it's interesting to compare the two. The Wisconsin project was small. Class sizes were reduced in just 14 schools, but it was noteworthy because it targeted schools at which a significant proportion of the students were from poor families, compared with California's one-size-fits-all approach. Analysts have found that the results are very similar to the Tennessee project, 
with students making gains that are statistically significant and that are considerably larger than those calculated for the California Initiative. Now, I'd like to apply some of these ideas to the latest... That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. I thought I had it figured out Believed in us We were meant to be, no doubt A teenage love Everybody else could see The way we were Living in a fantasy When I kiss her I don't